Salchpa y Guitana, Chukasha, Mechachata Saya. Carolina Tonga, Oblak, Yagimako, Ahisa Hanji, Bika Natoka, Hachimano. Hello, everyone. I greeted you in the Chiksa language and welcomed you to today's event on behalf of the American Indian Studies Center, which is co sponsoring this event with Repair. I told you my Chickasaw name, Ihuitana, and that I'm Chickasaw and Choctaw by descent. I'm a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation. Um, and I acknowledge the Gabrielino Tonga peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tobanga, which encompasses much of what is currently called Los Angeles, as well as the South Channel Islands, and upon which the American Indian Studies Center in UCLA reside. As a land grant institution, we pay our respects to the Honu Vitam ancestors, Ahihiram elders, and Eohinkam, our relatives and relations, past, present, and emerging. Thank you all for joining this special event with our honored guests, Chris Stark and Julian Taiwan. And I'll now turn it over to the wonderful Dr. Becky Bay, Director of Repair and Principal Organizer of today's event. Thank you so much, Shannon. I'm going to be brief, but I have the great honor of introducing Chris Stark whose novel Carnival, Carnival Lights is the focus of our event today. And also Julian Uggen, who is here as an honored commentator, uh, responding to her book as one of its early readers. So I'm gonna briefly introduce Julian and then spend a little more time introducing Chris. Julian Uggen is an, is an international human rights lawyer and the visionary behind Blue Ocean Law. His projects include working with the Marshall Islands to seek redress for the harms of nuclear testing and non-consensual medical experimentation, defending the fundamental right of self-determination of the native inhabitants of Guam before US federal courts and developing legal strategies to hold countries and corporations accountable for their contributions to climate change. He's currently a lecturer in law at the William S. Richardson School of Law at the University of Hawaii at Manoa and where he teaches Pacific Islands legal systems. And we're also really proud to have him as a founding and continuing board member of Repair. And uh, also uh, particularly honored to have him again at this event because we were so grateful to host a book event for his new book, The Properties of Perpetual Light uh, last month, which is now out and amazing and which featured and which event featured some wonderful commentary by Chris Stark. So it's really beautiful to continue to see you two in dialogue. So I next want to um, gratefully accept the honor of, a, a, of introducing Chris Stark, who is one of my personal heroes, as well as a longtime friend. I'm realizing that Chris and I have now known each other for 26 years um, and a person that I recognize ex ex as exceptional or exceptionally strong and ethical and imaginative in her approach to writing and to all the work she, that she does. Chris is a native Anishinaabe and Cherokee award-winning writer, researcher, visual artist, and national and international speaker. Her first novel, Nichols, A Tale of Dissociation, was an incredible book and uh, was also a Lambda Literary final, Finalist. Her essays, poems, academic writing, and creative nonfiction have appeared in numerous publications, including the Palgrave International Handbook on Trafficking, University of Pennsylvania Law Review, Dignity Journal, the WIP, the Florida Review, the Chalk Circle, Intercultural cultural Prize Winning Essays, When We Became Weavers, Queer Female Poets on the Midwest Experience, Hawk and Handsaw, the Journal of Creative Sustainability, and many others. Her poem, Mama Song, was first recorded by Fred Ho in the Afro-Asian music ensemble as a double manja CD. She's also co-editor of Not For Sale, Feminist Resisting Prostitution and Pornography. And and is a co-author of the groundbreaking research Garden of Truth, the Prostitution and Trafficking of Native Women in Minnesota. Primary research she conducted with Native women survivors of prostitution and trafficking on the ships in Duluth, Minnesota is included in her article, Strategies to Restore Justice for Sex Trafficked Native Women. She's also the co-author and co-researcher of Evidence Survivor Agency and Researcher Collaboration, an example of an emerging model of survivor well-being. 
Her writing has been nominated twice for a Pushcart Prize. In 2012, she was named as a change maker by the Women's Press and was a Loft Series Mentor finalist. In 2019, she received the International Social Justice Citizen Award from the International Leadership Institute. She's appeared in numerous media, including NPR, NPR, that's N as in Nancy and M as in Minnesota, <laughs> and PBS, Justice Talking and Robin Morgan's radio show. She's spoken at law schools, conferences, rallies, and at the United Nations four times. She's taught writing and humanity courses at universities and community colleges for 18 years and worked as a two-spirit program director at Minnesota Indian Women's Resource Center. Currently, she facilitates art and writing groups at Breaking Free in St. Paul, Minnesota, consults with a variety of local and national organizations, and teaches writing and literature at Anoka Ramsey Community College. She's a member of the Minnesota Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women Task Force. She has an MFA in writing and an MSW, and her second novel, Carnival Lights, will be published on July 1st. So I never really am able to put into words how special Chris Stark is and how deeply, profoundly um, grateful I am for her work. Many of us really relate to Chris as someone who lends oxygen in spaces where it's hard to breathe. She just has extraordinary, extraordinarily um, clear, powerful, artful, eloquent ways of speaking to profoundly devastating dynamics which render many of us speechless. So the kind of writer who can create powerful words in the face of mass devastation and silence, as you can imagine, is precious to a lot of us. So for those of you who know her work well, I'm just very grateful that you get to share in the honoring of her new novel today. For those of you who are being introduced, this is a very lucky day for you. So welcome to everyone. And I'm grateful to turn it over now to Chris Stark to share a reading from Carnival Lights. And then we'll leave it to Chris and Julian to be in dialogue. Uh, miigwech, everyone. Oh. <laughs> Um, I just want to thank everyone so much for being here. I appreciate that. I love seeing all of you. I look forward to when we can all be together again in person. I miss uh, so many of you on here. And um, I'm just grateful to meet the new people uh, as well. I want to thank Repair and the UCLA uh, American Indian Center and Beth and Julian and Shannon in particular for sponsoring this. You know, I was just emailing them a couple of days ago and it's just always such an astonishing honor when people engage with your writing it just uh you know, it's just always really a, an incredible experience and I'm like deeply grateful for that and I'm, I'm really grateful for all of you being here um <clears throat> so this book was a long time coming it's uh it's been in the works for quite a while so it's, it's kind of uh emotional for me to to be able to present it I'm, I'm just very happy about that um, and uh, before, I'm just going to do a short reading, maybe I think it's about 15 or so minutes long. And then uh, uh, Julian and I can have a little conversation. And if anybody else wants to share anything, you know, we can open up the space. Um, uh, and my uh, Anishinaabe name is uh, Nagamo Zibi Unse Kwe, uh, which means uh, Little Singing River Woman. And of course, my English name is Chris Stark. So, miigwech. Welcome, very glad that you're all here and um, looking forward to sharing this book uh, with all of you. So, Carnival Lights, Village of Park Point, August 3rd, 1860. The carnival came to town, but not until after the Indian bones were excavated. Under the red beam of the Minnesota Point Lighthouse cast by a fourth order Fresnel lens, and illuminated by a kerosene lamp, kerosene lamp, a motley assortment of Finnish, German, and French men wielding spades and pickaxes, broke joints, cracked femurs, shattered fingers, and split the skulls of those buried long before Europeans set foot on the shores of the westernmost tip of Gichigami. A former John Jacob Astor agent, in concert with the acting mayor of the unincorporated town of Duluth, made the decision to build a carnival to brighten the dour mood of the 60 odd dwelling on the shoreline and the few hundred in the logging and mining camps nearby. 
Although it was a hefty investment with questionable immediate return, the two men had plans for the port and needed to attract hundreds and then eventually thousands more European immigrants to build the city. Once other heard of the Grand Carnival held there, they believed, Europeans would come in droves. They were sitting on a gold mine of trade prospects now that they had moved the Indians off of the shoreline closer to Fond du Lac. The Indian graveyard had been a problem though. They did not need someone kicking up a bone during the carnival and causing a sensation, frightening business to St. Paul or Chicago. So the bones were hacked out of the soil by criminal castaways and thrown into a wagon drawn by a single draft horse lent by a man who used the horse to clear tree stumps from the burgeoning township. That is how the Indian bones traveled to their new home, nearly three miles down the river that flowed southward out of Gichigami. Two days after the removal, guided by the red beam of light, the Arawak steamer brought in supplies, a large metal wheel that hitched to a horse directly across from a wooden bench, such that as the horse walked in circles, Patrons rode the bench for four spins a penny around a 15 foot wide path. Called the Sweetheart Ride, it was the center attraction for the first ever carnival on the spit of land overlooking Gichigami, now on the maps as Lake Superior. The ride was the motivating factor behind George Washington Gale Ferris Jr.'s invention of the Ferris wheel, which would make its first appearance at the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago commemorating the 400 year anniversary of Christopher Columbus's landing an archipelago inhabited by the Taino and designed to be direct competition to the Eiffel Tower of the 1889 Paris Exposition. Four days later, a four wagon caravan arrived carrying workers, canvases, rope, tar, shovels, steak, lard, bags of flour, potatoes and dried pork and wood that transformed into four tents including a sideshow of Savage Joe and his squaw, a Ho-Chunk Indian man and a brother town mixed blood Indian woman who looked full blood. For three days, they set up camp, washed clothes on the rocks along the shoreline, mended costumes and cooked. After considerable labor by the carnival workers that extended late into the evenings under torchlight, the townspeople gathered for their first carnival on the Indian cemetery. Savage Indian Joe and his pretend wife rubbed okra over their faces and arms, donned goose feather headdresses unlike anything any of their ancestors ever wore, and lunged around a tent, waving their hands in the air and screaming gibberish, frightening women and children alike who paid a penny to sit on wooden benches and watch the heathens. An old French fur trader familiar with Indian ways looked into the future. He knew this would not end well. The rest enjoyed the frightful show, sucking on the sour birch, peppermint, lavender, and whorehound candies while basking in the torchlights that removed the cold and loneliness and hunger they endured thousands of miles from their land on the other side of the Atlantic. The Indians in the carnival made them feel superior not only to the red man, but to the squalor that they themselves lived in. One month later, after the carnival slogged westward over rutted paths, an old Ojibwe Indian lady living in a wigwam far enough out in the woods that the English, as she called all Europeans, had not removed her to the Fond du Lac reservation yet, walked seven miles alone to the site of her parents and her parents' parents and her parents' 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 graves. Born in 1784, her grandmother had told her one night when she was a girl of nine that their people knew the time would come when more and more English would arrive first by ships over water and later by ships in the air, bringing great death and destruction, the Windigo, the cannibal spirit. The old lady, the old Inge Ojibwe lady's grandmother told her that the English would make many lights that would guide the water and ships in the air to the land. One day would, there would be so many lights they would no longer see the stars and barely know the difference between day and night. All those lights, the old woman added, would make it hard for Indians to see the star people, our guardians and our guides, and slowly we will lose our ways. The lights will steal our people. The old Ojibwe lady, then just a girl, stepped outside the wigwam to look at the star people, hundreds of bright lights in the black sky. Her dog, Animush, stood watch at the edge of the clearing. The moon hung full just over the tops of the bare tree branches, 
their leaves the size of beaver ears. She couldn't imagine it, what her grandmother said about not being able to see the old ones. She bit a piece of tree candy her Nokomis had given her and slipped inside the wigwam, nestling into the warmth of her grandmother's belly and the beaver pelts they slept on. Decades later, stooped in a long skirt with a red willow basket over one forearm, the old Ojibwe lady wandered the shoreline where the carnival had been, occasionally bending over, setting something she picked up from the rocky shoreline into her basket. Unseen, except by a curious Finnish boy who watched her, she moved through the village of Park Point with a boy like a white shadow behind her. Crossing the spit of land into the unincorporated town of Duluth, a stray hound whose master had died six days after arriving on a ship, leaving the dog to fend for herself, lunged at the old woman and flung the contents of her basket onto the dirt. The old lady yelled words unintelligible to the boy and kicked the dog in the face, scaring it away. Kneeling, she regathered the contents of her basket and slipped behind an Englishman's tar paper shack. The young boy ran to where the woman had disappeared. Seeing no one, he searched the ground as he had overheard men discussing their quest for rocks that would make them wealthier than the czar. Whoever that was, he thought. The boy's mother had recently died, giving birth to a baby sister who also died. His eight-year-old sister took over cooking and sewing and stoking the fire at night, while their father searched for work in the logging camps further north. The children were starving. Near where the dog bit the old woman, his eye caught a pearly white shape in the dirt. Grabbing it, thinking perhaps it would be the special rock the men had talked about, the boy ran, lest one of the men take what he had found. Long and smooth, about the length of the boy's middle finger, he gave it to his sister, who mistook it for a bird bone and boiled it in the water she collected from the Great Lake for their dinner that night, and the next night, and the next, and then the one after that. So after the prologue there, the book goes straight into the main forward story, uh, which is about two Ojibwe teen cousins who leave their fictitious Northern Minnesota reservation, which is just east of Duluth, for those of you who know the area, um, and they head to Minneapolis. But I'm gonna jump forward a little bit and read an excerpt about one of the girls, or the girl's ancestors, uh, one of their ancestors. So uh, this little subsection is called Thatcher's Trail, April, 1891. Leonard cut through the waist high ferns in the forest. Three new white men down at the clearing were talking about two more wigwams and an abandoned log house that burned the day before. He didn't want to hear more and didn't want them to see him. So he cut a wide swath around them until he reached the swell in the forest floor on the Northeast side of the clearing. Then he could trot upright between the clearing to the ferns that, if stretched upright, were taller than he. As his legs whispered through the ferns, still and silent as far as he could see, Leonard swept the horror of the bloated, pus and blood covered faces and arms out of his mind. The lolling heads and rigid limbs that had no one to bury them. Occasionally he, on his own, had found wigwams and tar paper shacks burned to the ground. The charred shrunken bodies like burned out tree stumps leaving behind limbless black trees stark against a charcoal sky. In the end, all returned to the earth. Leonard knew that that was what the white man's religion taught too, but he didn't understand their irreverence, their greed. Some said it was white men sent by the doctors in town who set fire to the burned Indians. Some said Indians were doing it. Leonard did not know who set the fires. Maybe both were right. He knew some Indians did for the white men, worked with them to get English clothes and the land for themselves. Leonard watched and he waited and he prayed he, they wouldn't all die like that. The people disappearing without proper ceremonies. What would happen to their spirits? Indian ways were disintegrating like the white man's paper they burn. Useless, the old one said, except for fire starting. Some Indians didn't know what the papers were about. They'd never seen them before. Who would think a piece of paper would equal the earth? What sort of person could believe that? Others knew the papers were about the land and the dead and dying Indians that the white men and some mixed Indians leered over, their cannibal words buzzing over the wires strung through the trees between Anwanton and St. Paul. 
The lumber barons on Summit wouldn't live in such an uncivilized place, but they had their emissaries among the Indians, some of whom were breeds, and then of course, the white men, and they tapped out their directives that traveled at great speeds across the wires, among shimmering leaves and over snow, barren, sweat fields. As Leonard stepped over a fallen tree, he wondered how a piece of paper could have anything to do with the land, the trees and the animals and the earth and the water. There was no equation between the land and a sheet of paper with the black markings of crow's feet. He and his grandfather had walked this fern forest many times, the fronds long and wide like great arms waving in the wind. Green as, Leonard thought, but here Leonard's mind stumbled for there was a specific Indian word for this late spring color of the fronds, a bright green like the tavern sign he'd seen in town the other day, but not quite. His grandfather had used the Indian word for green forest ferns at this time of the spring with him many times as they made their way to the bay. Already he could not remember it. A woodpecker knocked a hole above him, the sound a rat tat tat, the word meant a specific green, longer and more complicated than bright or forest or mint, or any way that green was used in the English language. It was a word that came up from the land, not from a man-made object that was then transferred to describe the land. His thighs brushed the fronds in his path. How could forest mean one green? One glance and his eyes captured 20, 30 greens. The Indian word also told of the time of year and the specific plant and the shape its leaves took at that time and the place, growth, green is life. Leonard remembered his grandfather saying, my boy, look, see the tips of these branches at this time of spring? And he pointed to the tips of a pine branch that were bright light green against the dark green of the older growth. The trees grow their fingernails and toenails now. But even one Indian word for green, Leonard could not recall, not one. So I'm gonna jump forward in the book a little bit more. And um, the two girls, uh, the two cousins, Sharon and Chris, uh, have just arrived in Minneapolis and uh, they landed in the bus station in downtown Minneapolis. And they were just chased out of the bus station by uh, two men. And this is Minneapolis, August 1969. The girls ran into the dark street. The pack slapped against Cher's back. In here, she pulled Kristen down a narrow brick alley. A cat ran off. Cher cut behind a garbage can, lost her footing and slid into a pile of bite, bulky garbage bags. Kristen tumbled behind her. The girls froze like the statue game they used to play. It smelled like fish and sour milk. Footsteps approach. Cher peered between the cans and reached back reflexively and touched Kristen's lips. The well-dressed man stepped into the alley, stopped, and then continued down the sidewalk. Cher watched the street and Kristen watched her, her head low. The girls did not move. A man trotted by from the direction of the bus depot. Cher thought, but could not be sure that it was the first man, the one with the shiny flat bottom shoes half running because he could not lift his feet high enough or fast enough without slipping. After he passed the alley, Cher looked at Kristen and lifted her eyebrows as if to say, who knows? When the girls were babies, their grandmother pinched their lips to teach them silence. The girls knew how to be still, not make any sound, thoughtful even of their breathing, until their grandmother found them flat on the floor beneath the handmade horsehair stuffed mattress or under the workshelf in the basement over which their grandmother had draped an old wool blanket to hide them from the white lady social workers who came looking to steal Indian children. When older, if the girls were out in the yard and heard a car different than the rattle of their grandparents' truck, they'd run to the house or barn or the shred. If in the fields, the girls stood stock still in line with the corn rows or dove into an indentation in the earth where they stayed until the bell on the porch rang four times. Their grandmother only dyed their homespun clothes earth colors, leaving behind the brightly beaded and dyed regalia of her youth to make sure her babies did not pop out of the browns and greens in the field like red choke cherries before they ripen into a purple mass hanging off a heavy branch. If in the house when the whites drove up unannounced, their grandmother would command down and the girls would run, slide and duck into their hiding holes, listening, 
breathing without sound, always waiting for the bell, four times. The girls stayed in the alley for some time, occasionally glancing behind them where the alley dog leg to the right. A silence rode up, rose up around them, split by sirens and the squeals of wheels. No bell rang four times so they could come out of hiding, bury themselves in their grandmother's belly and fleshy arms. Cher glanced from the street to the alley behind them, then back again. Her knee and, ch and shin swelled up from the crash into the bags. Anxiety rose in Chris. She rested her head on Cher's calf. Cher smoothed her cousin's hair and kept watch, breathing through her mouth to minimize the smell, wanting to spit, but afraid of the noise that would make. Time sp stilled, the moon edged west, Cher thought of the story about how time was brought to Indians by a big clock, and she could see her grandfather telling the story again, his skinny brown legs jutting up off the upside down bucket he sat on. Since then, he'd say, his eyes shining with that light that popped when he told stories. Indians have been weighted down, and he'd pull an imaginary chain around his neck, just like the white man by that tick-tock time machine. Voices drifted down the alley. Sherry hunched, Cher hunched, found a crack she could peer through, and then locked her body in that position. Chris buried her head in Cher's legs. The voices neared. The depot men stopped and looked down the alley. Look down there? No need, the new man said. I would have seen them turn. The man with the shiny flat bottom shoes stared down the alley. They're gone, for now. One's Indian, maybe both. We'll find them, said the new man. Can't hide on these streets forever. The two men continued towards the bus depot. Ice water trickled down Cher's spine. She put her finger to Chris's lips just in case the men were still in earshot. She felt down her knee, tender to the touch on the inside, to a wide flat bump on her shin. After 20 minutes, hearing nothing, Cher tapped Chris. The girl stood. Cher shook her leg out in an effort to get the blood flowing. She dared not loosen the laces. The girls turned right down the alley that slammed into the one that they were in, walking past ripped garbage bags with chewed out halves of squash and fish bones and milk cartons and butter wrappers strewn about. Must be cat or coons, Cher said. Yeah, or rats, yeah. They scanned for their droppings or the animals themselves, hiding out behind bags or scurrying off or looking up from a feast of rotted food, their eyes picking out everything in the dark. But Sharon and Kristen saw no one. The girls reached a narrow street with no curbs, just wide enough for one car to pass through. No people and no cars, only tall, dark buildings rising up around them. Cher motioned for Chris to follow her away from the street she had last seen the two men on. The one who chased us came back looking for us, she said. Yeah? Cher did not see any reason to tell Kristen that the two men had tried to work them over as a team in the depot. It would frighten her. Cher's long black hair flung down over her back and shoulders and onto her chest. The right side of her body had a black dirt streak from the cuff of her jeans all the way up to her shoulder. She walked with a bad limp, but her face showed nothing, not the tiredness or the hunger or the fear. Chris wondered if Cher was afraid as she was so afraid she thought she would throw up. Cher? Yeah? They reached a main road and turned east, away from the bus depot. We look like quite a pair. So I'll stop there and uh, just witch again for being here. Um, so I guess it's my turn. <clears throat> Chris, thank you so much for uh, di reading from different um, <clears throat> sections of the book. Um, clearly you weave in, a, in and out of time. Um, in the book, and we'll, I'll get to that. But I just wanted to say thank you so much um, for allowing me to be um, the person who's commenting on your book and asking you questions. I, I, th I really thought long and hard about what I wanted to ask you, and so we'll just get right into it. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> violence against Native women is a national crisis. The data is crystal clear. Nearly half of all Native American women, 46%, have experienced rape, physical violence, or stalking by an intimate partner. One in three Indian women will, at some point in her life, experience violence and the trauma of rape. 
on some reservations, Native American women are murdered at a rate more than 10 times the national average. These statistics reflect the normalization of violence against Native women in this country. As Indian law attorney and advocate Sarah Deer notes, predators may in fact target Native women and girls precisely because they are perceived as marginalized and outside the protection of the American legal system. Of course, it's not only the statistics that are alarming, it's the glaring lack of awareness among the general population is also extremely disturbing. Um, this is just one of the many, many reasons I'm so excited for your precious new book to be out in the world. Um, your book, um, it seems to me, seeks to force a national reckoning. In fact, we are actually coming on May 5th. It's May 1st here in Guam, so I'm a day ahead. So literally just four days away from the National Day of Awareness for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. In other words, yours is a medicine story and you are giving it to us at a time when we need it most, at a time when thousands of our sisters have been murdered or are still missing. So I guess my first question is, as you were writing this book, would you say any or all of these women were breathing in your ear? Yeah, that's a, a great um, question. And, and that is exactly how this book uh, felt to me. And it was uh, women and also men and boys as well in the book. Um, and it feels, uh, you know, it, it's funny. I, I want to say that my process of writing this book and also my first novel, Nichols, is it's a little bit more like the, the story exists somewhere and I, I go to that place where the story exists and try to bring back as much of it as I can. That, that's how I experience it, which is not to you know, say that, you know, obviously like my own interests or you know, awareness and so forth is like obviously in the book, but it's, this, um, it's, a, it's a collaborative process. It's a creative process. And um, it's not super popular to, uh, you know, in like the, dominant culture uh, writing world to, to talk about going to another place and getting your story and bringing it back. But, you know, I think that's just the, the truth of it, um, certainly for me and I know for, for other writers as well, um, that it, 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 I very much feel like a steward of the story. And um, these characters feel, you know, they feel very real to me. Um, I, I thought that I was done with this novel seven years ago. I was I actually was just sitting down to attach it to an email and send it to the publisher. And all of a sudden this character just kind of introduced himself to me and it was Leonard. And he, his whole, like his whole story came to me in about a minute and uh, I got it down and I sobbed for a week, <laughs> you know? So um, it's, it's, a, it's a very intense uh, process. It's a very interesting process. I think it's hard to try to describe it, um, but uh, yeah, it, 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 you know, it, it definitely, I don't want to say it, it speaks for other people that feels a little bit um, grandiose, but I certainly hope that um, through these, these characters, you know, people have a greater awareness and understanding who don't understand these issues. And for those of us who have been through these things that hopefully we see some kind of um, representation or connection with the characters. Um, yeah, so I, I don't I didn't um, script this, but I just want to throw other questions at you that are coming to mind. Now, um, who was the first character that came to you? I assume it was Cher, uh, because she's such a strong presence in the book. But I mean, is that true? Yeah, Cher and Chris, right, both of them right away. Yeah, both Cher and Chris right away. Um, and then uh, probably uh, Jacob was one of the next ones to come along, the, the gay Jewish boy that they meet and when they get into Minneapolis, the young boy. Um, and, uh, yeah, they, they were, they were very prominent right away. I actually started this story about Sharon and Chris like 20 years ago. So it's even a bigger set of emotions for me because mm -hmm. it's a long time to, to sit with something and, uh, yeah, the, the book has evolved and changed significantly over, you know, the past couple of decades, I guess. Yeah, no. So actually that's sort of, it's. I just want to ask a follow-up question then. Would you, I know you sort of think of the writing process as like co-creative, right? It's kind of like you as well as the characters speaking for themselves. And I know that we've talked before and I know that you try to allow your characters to breathe in that way. 
and to really, you know, develop their own voice and they speak to you and the story emerges and changes over time. But um, do you ever struggle or find yourself trying to impose your will uh, on the character and then you ended up going back and how, how much did that feature in any of the characters? Well, I, I was, um, I had a very difficult time working on it in the, actually the past seven years. And I started to get very, um, uh, having a sense of despair that I was not gonna finish this book. Um, and I, I couldn't figure it out. I would just sit with the computer and I would be like, you know, sit, sit, sit. And finally I was like, well, I'm not just gonna sit, you know, forever in front of this computer if this book's not gonna come to me. So I kind of, you know, walked away from it and would rejoin it every once in a while. And it just, um, it, was, it was like, uh, you know, being dragged through the mud sometimes, it just wouldn't come. Or I would know like two little pieces and then it would all come. So it's all on its own time, this book. It has its own life, it has its own energy and its own time. And um, I, was, I was telling some friends a couple of months ago that I was really, again, trying to hurry up to finish it up. And um, one of the great grandmothers, of the two girls, Sharon and Chris, uh, sort of came forward in the story and, and I had two pieces of information about all of that and I was waiting, waiting and all of a sudden it all just came to me. And then um, I was uh, you know tired and laying in bed or whatever and this information just kept coming to me. It was like all these details upon details upon details and I was like, oh, okay, man, all right. Like I, I forgot that one minor, minor, minor detail. It's okay, it'll be okay. No, the grandmother was like, you get up and put that in there right now. <laughs> so um, I know, I think Susan Power kind of talks similarly about her writing process. I know some people that sounds a little nutty, but that's all right, you know? <laughs> so For I had sure. to get up and put it in there. I, you know, I got to do right by the characters. <laughs> Yeah, no, for sure. I um, mean, yeah, and definitely some of your characters are really strong-willed, for sure. And I, I think that's what makes it really, really awesome. I thought Cher is my favorite character, just so you know. I like them all, but Cher is absolutely my favorite. Um, yeah. So I, I have a follow-up question about gen, uh, genre. Uh, can we talk about like the the, the, for, the different forms? So I did a bit of digging and I was able to find some of your past writings, actually many of your past writings, uh, ranging from the autobiographical to the academic. Um, and they're all compelling in different ways and for different reasons. Um, so um, one of the things that I remember, I, I caught an interview, I think it was from in 2013, it could be, uh, where you were actually talking about how writing, the writing process brings you joy, you know, because it sort mm -hmm. of destroys the chains of isolation, as you say. I think that's mm -hmm. how you said it, destroys the chains of isolation. And you said that writing is freedom or at least movement toward freedom. So yes, when I was reading that, I was like, okay, the whole time I was reading, I was thinking, or <clears throat> after I read that, I immediately reread the book with that sort of lens. And I was thinking, I was wondering whether you also felt that writing fiction in particular, um, did you find that uh, particularly liberating? Or I guess to put it another way, do you feel more free in fiction? And do you feel that you can actually tell more truth in fiction? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely do. And, and it's always interesting to listen to people say, oh, I don't want to read any fiction, you know, because I just, I just want something that's real and true. And, um, you know, I always kind of think to myself, oh, if you knew it from the writer's perspective, you know, you can say uh, so much more uh, through fictional characters than you might be comfortable saying in a memoir essay, right? <laughs> um, so I, I think that's true. And I, I think also that, you um, I think that the um, dominant culture and uh, colonization and, and its ideas about what is um, uh, fiction and what is, um, you know, tr quote unquote, true and historical, um, I think there's, those are very interesting things that we could deconstruct um, and think very differently about. They seem like actually very random uh, uh, divisions to me and, and really, um, I'm not so sure that there's all that much difference, especially if you're looking at the history of the United States. That's obviously one of the themes in my book. If you're looking at the history of the United States and that's real, true and factual, you know, that's how, how many people view that. And it's like, well, I know, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so really you can bring forward the, the, the truth of these issues um, through your fiction. And I actually, in this book, I have quite a bit of research in it so um, it really blends um, 
the fictional story of the two girls, uh, fictional story, um, and their families, uh, fictional stories, but much of what is happening around them, and I bring in um, historical characters in Minnesota, politicians and, you know, Charles Lindbergh and all these other situations that are actually factual. Um, and and I, I mix them, I kind of mix them all together. And um, if people want to know for sure, for sure, is this absolutely historic, you know, is this absolutely true? Then they, they should get it. They'll have to look on Google. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. No, no, it was great. There was, there were so many details. I was like, even down to the, the different ethnic groups that occupied the area at different times in history. And so, yeah, I encourage people to, I think people will do it. I think your readers will naturally do some, you know, historical research just to sort of fill in the gaps, but you point them in so many different directions. So it's great. Um, but, you know, one of the things that, uh, the other things I was thinking about, about time, you know, where you were just sort of talking about taking aim sort of at the, the a Western sort of conceptions, but also this, the way you play with time in the book is, is quite something. Um, you collapse time all the time. <laughs> like we're in the middle of a scene between Sharon and Chris, and then we're in a scene with M, you know? And so mm -hmm. you weave back and forth and in and out um, of time and you go between generations in this family. But it's almost so much so that sometimes it feels like in the book when Cher and Chris are going through their immediate battles and they're you know trying to evade the predators down that alley that you just read about, for example, or then at the carnival later on in the book, you know, when they're doing that, it almost feels like that suffering, their suffering, you can almost see it almost superimposed, you know, onto the suffering of previous generations, you know. And so I wanted to ask you a little bit about your decision to write it in this way. Like, for example, um, is part of your point or is part of the point that you're really trying to make in this book that the violence against Native women is part of an uninterrupted historical pattern going back to the very beginnings of this country? Because that's what I got out of it. I, and I actually thought of Strange Fruit, the song, you know, it's not blood, not only on the leaves, but at the root, you know? And so like, what, can you comment on that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that uh, I, I, I say is that, you know, there's a saying uh, that history repeats itself and when you look at um, history for indigenous people on Turtle Island, um, it's not so much a repetition as just a, a straight shot of a, like a pipeline going right through the same things, the same you know uh, institutions uh, are, are continuing on with their exact same behavior uh, that Christopher Columbus started when he landed, um, you know, on the Taino, Taino's land. I think I'm saying that correctly. Um, and so that is absolutely part of, of the point of that. And another um, part of that is just the interconnections that Native people, Anishinaabe people, you know, that we have these connections with our ancestors. They're not dead and gone. They're still with us. Uh, they're watching over us. Uh, they're, they're, always, they're, they're always with us. We're not alone in this world the way that the dominant culture likes to talk about you're born alone into the world. That's not a you know, a, a native um, or Anishinaabe way of seeing things. And so those connections, um, they carry on. And now we have epigenetics, right? Where the dominant culture is talking about what native people and Jewish people and African-American people, you know, have been talking about for a while. And so I really wanted to make uh, those connections clear. And I think that when you my experience uh, has been that when I look, I find a piece of, you know, some kind of trauma or something that I need to sort of move through and heal in myself. And I, I kind of pull that out a little bit. And underneath that, you know, I see those connections to maybe my grandmother's, um, basically their fear of being Indian and, and their silence around being Indian and the trauma that they carried with them that then I can still find sometimes that passed along to me. Um, and the other piece with that is that the belief that um, when we heal ourselves now in this world that we're in, um, we're healing our ancestors as well. And so our healing helps our ancestors. That's obviously a very different idea um, than, than what the dominant culture has about healing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was that was actually my next question. So you've already answered it. Yeah. Actually, and I, I, yeah, I totally hear you on it. Um, so another question I have is about the use of your book. Um, I actually think that your book can be used, I see it being used actually in so many different ways by different people doing different things. But one of the audiences that I think, I think one of its most enthusiastic homes 
will be community organizations um, that are doing on the ground work. Um, and the first, like, for example, the first group I thought it was uh, Anita Lucchesi's um, Sovereign Bodies Institute, right? And so the, because they're all about generating understanding of how Native communities ha have been and continue to be impacted by gender and sexual violence, you know, and helping them unpack that and heal from that. And I actually see this Anita Lucchesi taking your book and running into the wind with it, you know? I mean, do you sort of feel the same way about that? I mean, do you, do you sort of see, who do you see as your audience or who do you most want to read your book? That's a great question. It's a complicated answer, I think. Um, I, I, I think that I think that I wrote this for my ancestors. That's, that's what I think. Um, and so that I think that's at the core of it. And I, I have a significant amount of love for this book and these characters, I really do. Um, but I, I want it to be accessible to everyone. Um, you know, I, I want it, I hopefully wrote it in a way that is um, uh, connected and true and its main focus would be, um, you know, Indian people, native people, indigenous people. Um, but I, uh, you know, there are some things, little things here and there that I, ch I changed in the book or I kind, I kind of would, you know, add in an explanation because I, you know, I'm not, my point isn't to shut out everybody else either. So I really want it obviously to have as broad a, a readership as it possibly can. Um, and uh, I, I think I really appreciate your calling it like a, you know, a medicine and a gift because that the way I look at it is as a gift. Like I hope this to be a gift that can go out and can not only create you know, awareness and perhaps even be um, helpful with public policy issues, because like I said, there's a lot of historical, like the Nelson Act is, is referenced in that, and that was specific to Minnesota around allotment. So there's a lot of stuff like that in there that can appeal to sort of those kinds of crowds. But I think at the, the core of it is I, I really want this to be a healing book. Mm -hmm. uh, I want this to be healing. I, I very much hope it's healing for Anishinaabe and you know indigenous communities and around the issues of MMIR. Um, but also, you know, uh, I, you know, we talk in the Native community a lot about um, like our uh, bringing forward sort of the the spirit of our ancestors and um, the awareness and having, having this knowledge from our ancestors, we have that in our bodies, you know, literally. Um, and also, you know, as part of that, it's important for white people uh, to take a look at, at the actual history, you know, of, of what maybe some of their ancestors did and do their own healing around that because they have their own healing to do um, around that. And I, I want this book to, I hope that this book facilitates that in a good way, in a, in a gentle way, you know, in a way, because we can fight with each other and live out of our egos and destroy the earth, <laughs> you know, yeah, no. or we can move into this spiritual place where we're all working to heal and we're all working to let down our egos and, and the earth, the earth needs us to do that. The animals and the water, the, plants, they need us to do that. We need them, they don't need us. And uh, so I just hope it's a, a healing. That's my biggest hope for it. I really think it will. I think it will. I, I just can't say that enough. Honestly, I think your book will help um, so many people from so many different communities, in fact, feel held and seen and, and free. I think that's all you can ask from a good book. And I think you, your book does that. Um, yeah, and I guess, um, I, I don't know, I, Beth, how are we on time? I had a couple more questions, but we don't even need to go into Keep that. Going. I'm so not going to cut this off. Keep going. Okay. No, seriously. Okay. One of the other things that it's just, just we're in conversation with so many writers at once, you know, in some ways, like you are part of my beloved community now. Mm -hmm. Very, that's very clear to me. You know, we, you know, I share this like love of language, you know, this belief in a, like radical listening you know, especially to the lives of those beings, those sentient beings that are not human, right? That are more vulnerable than ours. I see that in your writing, I see it in mine. I see like, I mean, and I see it in the way you've described minnows in the past, 
and the way I've just cried um, tree snails. I mean, there's like, we, in some ways, both of us have like learned empathy from insects and from small little things like fish. And like, I mean, you know, in our story, and in that way, you know, our, our, liter our writing is connected. But I think something that I thought about too, um, when reading your work was, I just had like, Aurora Levins Morales, which is actually Beth's favorite writer. Like, you know, also I just felt like she was breathing in your ear as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, just as an influence, because I mean, what she says about like what she, she's gifted, us, uh, gifted all of us so many important political insights, right? About mm -hmm. our health and well being and about systemic oppression and anti subordination and our sort of shared struggle for collective liberation. But it's the word collective that I maybe want to end with, like this, this notion. I think. Part of what you're doing and the way you weave back and forth and in and out of time and the way like M's generation and Cher and Chris's generation and you see them sort of like side you don't see them side by side it actually you see them all at once and mm -hmm. they're actually quite powerful for me because I realize now why Aurora Levin's Morales sort of why the language of intersectionality irritates her I, I read it before but I didn't get it before you know, yeah. she, it irritates her, but she was like, we're not little streets that intersect like this, yeah. you know, on the corner of gender and race, you know, yeah. but she was like, it's, it's so much more complex than that. And it's also so much better and so much deeper than just like sort of, in some ways I've used myself, the language of intersectional solidarity. I've used it, friends use it, but now in this other way, <clears throat> inspired by what Aurora has already said and gifted us, I see your book as like adding to this conversation. It adds to this dimension because like the generations sit on top of each other in this mm -hmm. book, you know, mm -hmm. and until we get to the root, until we really are radical, you know, we, you know, we do radical listening among other things, you know, we're not going to sort of change the down dangerous downward trajectory that we are all on, you know, we have, to, and that's what I love so much about your book. It's just, you know, a celebration of not only, I mean, because yes, the, the characters, you know, pred predators abound in the book. And, and Cher and Chris are vulnerable in the book, but they're also resilient, you know, and they're also, they're fighting hard as hell, you know? And so that's what we're all doing. We're all like down an alley together, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and predators abound yeah. now in real time. And I just think your book is a gift, I, I do. And I don't really have so much as a question now, it's, uh, just as a, a written appreciation. So uh -huh. I really thank you so much for writing the book and I think it will help you know, native women everywhere, but also everyone, even people like me, a queer indigenous person struggling against colonization and militarization on this tiny island that America still colonizes. Yeah. And I think that's the mark of a great book. We just cross all borders, the borders are over, you know. Yeah. And the book just reminds me about how porous we really all are. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate all of what you said so much and it resonates with me. And I think, I. You know, I think almost one of the main themes in this book would be connections. It's like this idea of associational logic, right? And all of these connections. And there's that, you know, um, themes of uh, uh, Nazis and white supremacy in Minnesota directed at Native people, African American people, Jewish people, you know, and like what you're talking about, um, you know, from your life and your lived experiences. Um, but, you know, I think also. Um, something that uh, I hope is true with the book is that it it looks at these things you know straight on, um, and it it doesn't mince words uh, when when there are um, brutal things that that are being done or happening in the book. Um, but that that is uh, that's not gratuitous. It is for me written out of love, and it's written out of love of telling the truth and being honest and the need to look at that and find a way out of it. And so I think that's one of the things that, that really matters to me in this book. Um, and that I've also um, been, been doing, you know, in my life to the best of my ability. Um, to me, that's an expression of love is, is speaking the truth in Anishinaabe Moen, Debwe. Debwe is the truth. It's one of our, you know, one of our sacred values is to speak the truth. Um, so, you know, out of that, I would hope the truth and I hope that love and this idea that, like you were saying with the insects, you know, this is one of my favorite times of year right now, 
because we have all of these horrible things happening in the world. We could sit and talk about them forever and ever and pollution and pipelines and rape and all of these other things. But every time this year, throughout the course of my whole life, there are those little tiny flowers popping up out of the soil and the buds start coming out and you can hear the birds and life is beautiful. You know, life is mis mysterious, it's beautiful, it's brutal. And um, the more that we live out of love and put our egos down, the better chance we have of, of, uh, of going forward and, and uh, returning the earth to its healthy self. And in that process, we will return to health and balance as well. So Miigwech, I so appreciate you. You know, I appreciate everyone here. It's really, it's a, it's really a deep honor for me. So, thank you, Chris. Yeah. So, if I tried to find words to express admiration or gratitude or love right now, I wouldn't be able to do it justice. So, imagine all that as I say, say thank you, Chris, and also thank you, Julian. It was beautiful to see you in conversation. I want to thank the audience for joining us. Um, and I've put a link in the Zoom chat so that you can find more if you need more beautiful energy. We're hearing from another author in May, Tari Pickens, who's gonna be joining us to share some of her incredible poetry on May 21st. Repair is, we are always incredibly grateful to partner with the UCLA American Indian Studies Center. Uh, that's my cat Harriet joining the conversation. Um, and I wanna especially invite folks to join us on May 20th for a virtual dialogue uh, titled The Roots and Persistence of White Nationalism in the United States, featuring Shannon Speed, who gave our greeting at the beginning of this event, and again, co-sponsored with the American Indian Studies Center, and also visiting two really brilliant and amazing leaders, Hector Amaya and Gina Green. So I hope folks will come out for that and stay with us. Um, as we continue to create virtual space and comfort and clarity and um, be grateful for those who are with us. Uh, Shannon, did you have any additional announcements you wanted to make today or anything to share? Oh, okay. Sounds like Shannon's saying no, but if you do have any- I wanted to say thank you to our wonderful guest speakers today. This was such a moving and, and just a wonderful event. So thank you both so much. Thanks. And again, huge thanks to the American Indian Studies Center for uh, always being such an incredible partner and community to connect with. So with all of that gratitude and excitement for next things and excitement to continue to engage with this book, I'm going to say thanks for everybody. Chris, anything that else that you want to say or was your last meg with your final comment? No, I muted myself because my my dog is going nuts upstairs. So, no, just just you know, huge appreciation for everyone, and and um, let's go forward and make the world a better place. All right, beautiful note to end on. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us.